Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, welcoming you to another video where we take a look into the global history of retro gaming's past. Each week on this channel we focus on a different, often overlooked system and take a look at why it was made and how it performed. In today's video we are going to take an in-depth look at the Atari 2800, or simply 2800 as I like to refer to it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Atari's entry into the Japanese market. Yeah! When it comes to Atari, like many companies I regularly cover on this channel, such as Sega and NEC, Atari have an entire cornucopia of consoles and computers amongst their back catalogue. The Atari Corporation were certainly a company who would never shy away from releasing hordes of hardware when it came to the video game and technology markets. Atari often had their grubby little fingers in a variety of pies simultaneously. As mentioned on this channel previously, there was one point in time when Atari had a whole range of different games consoles, 8-bit and 16-bit computers, all on the market simultaneously. In fact, over the years, Atari have released so much hardware, it can be somewhat difficult to look back now and unravel it. But do not worry, Big Daddy Top Hat has you covered on the history of a range of different Atari platforms, right here on this channel for you to go back and view. Also, as mentioned earlier, today we shall be focusing in on the Japanese Atari 2800. So what was this system exactly and why did it exist? Well, the Atari 2800 is basically just a variant of the Atari 2600 and as a result shares the same library of games. As you will probably be aware, it is not uncommon for systems to be redesigned when released overseas. The most famous example of this are of course the Japanese Famicom and Super Famicom, which were redesigned and repurposed as both the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System to enter the American market. Interestingly, American company Atari chose to make the same move when entering Japan, several years before Nintendo tried to break America. Whilst Nintendo's American Conquest redesign decisions were first made to make the NES look less games console-like, I would infer that Atari's redesign for Japan looks to have been made simply as a new coat of paint being applied to an aging piece of hardware. The Atari 2800 was not released in Japan until 1983, by which point in time the 2600 had already been out for six years in America, so it is no wonder that the system needed a repolish. It is of note that the 2800 aesthetics shares more in common with the soon to be released Atari 5200, 7800 and 2600 Junior, rather than it does with the traditional VCS. Away from just looking a bit different, the 2800 has four controller ports, as opposed to the standard two, and a brand new type of controller, featuring an all-in-one design that fits more comfortably in the user's hands. These controls feature an eight-position joystick and two 70-degree panel controls. Although this Atari console was designed for the Japanese market, it would not be long before a variant of this variant would hit US shores regardless. One of Atari's main US distributors, Sears, would soon release the exact same console under their own company branding, rechristening the system the Sears Arcade 2. The platform was essentially exactly the same as the 2800, the only difference was that the system featured different nameplates on the controllers and control decks. So, with this snazzy new variant of the aging Atari VCS, how did this system do in Japan, and what exactly was the American-based company up against competition-wise in the land of the rising sun? Prior to 1983, gaming was very different in Japan and other parts of the world. At this point in time, console gaming in Japan had not yet became mainstream, nor popular. The market-leading console crown was held by the Epoch Cassette Vision of this period. The cassette vision had moderate success between 1981 and 1983, which can easily be attributed to the system's cheapness. Whilst it would be fun today to discuss this system in more detail, I do not want to get sidetracked too much 
as the spotlight is firmly on the 2800. Besides, the cassette vision deserves its own in-depth video on this channel down the line anyway, so we will revisit this subject. Anyway, the success of the cassette vision would have acted as somewhat of a catalyst in attracting Atari to Japan in the first place. Not only was this a market that was yet to be saturated with console hardware, but it was also a market with a penchant for budget systems. So the repackaged Atari VCS in some ways seemed like a good fit for Japan. Whilst this all seemed to make sense, sadly for Atari, none of this panned out, quite how the company would have hoped, and a slew of different problems resulted in a completely failed invasion for the American company on Japanese soil. The first of these problems occurred at home for Atari back in US territory. By this point in time, we have all heard of the frickin' video game crash of 1983, and whilst this event was not a global pandemic, like some historians would lead us to believe, the events that unfolded was enough to cause financial damage to Atari. In fact, when people talk about a video game crash, the true incident that took place was that people had essentially just became sick of a 2600. By this point, as mentioned, the platform was six years old and extremely dated. The company had saturated the national market, and as a result, people had become bored and disinterested in the platform. With all of this taking place, the Japanese endeavour would at some point have looked like a ray of hope for the company. This was until that exact same bloody year Nintendo would release their Famicom system, a games console that as we know would change Japanese gaming forever. The Famicom graphically made for six year old Atari technology look like an archaic baby's toy in comparison. So, it is no wonder most of Japan opted to grab the Nintendo platform instead of what Atari had put on offer. Further to this, it is of note that the Sega SG-1000 console was also launched on the exact same day as the Famicom. This precursor to the Master System essentially had the exact same innards as the ColecoVision and, as a result, could display games with the same graphical fidelity. The ColecoVision graphically was light years ahead of Atari's platform, and one would assume that the only reason the system never beat Atari on US soil was probably down to not having the right distribution deals to compete with the more established Atari brand. Japan though was a different story altogether. So in both America and Japan, everything had began to go wrong for Atari, although in Japan this was partially down to more powerful hardware becoming successfully established. But with this in mind, you would think that perhaps Atari could have still carved a niche as a budget system. This was never the case though, as hilariously, the 2800 was much more expensive than that of the Famicom. The Famicom launched at 14,800 yen, whereas the Atari system was an outrageous 24,800 yen, meaning that you would have been a complete moron to have wanted to procure this stupidly overpriced piece of tat. Further to all of this as well, the games that were being released on the Famicom all had the Japanese market in mind. Most games that were being released for the system were ambitious and culturally appropriate for that consumer base, whereas Atari's games by that point were mostly old tired imports featuring uninspiring visuals by comparison. Due to this lack of success, the Atari 2800 only saw around 30 different games being released on the platform in Japan which is a tiny fraction of games in comparison to what the Atari VCS had available for it in other regions around the world at the time. So to summarise this story, the Atari 2800 may be one of the dumbest system launches I have covered yet on this channel, and when you look at all the odds that were stacked up against Atari at the time, it feels like it is almost impossible to come up with any scenario where they could have made the system work in the country at this time. If you enjoyed this video, I have plenty more in-depth videos on gaming history within this channel's back catalogue, so make sure you like, comment and hit the subscribe button and notification bell to get brand new videos like this sent straight to your phone every single week. Let me know how you think the 2800 could have become a little bit more successful. Finally, my channel Top Hat Gaming Man is funded by the fantastic support I receive from my amazing Patreon benefactors who continuously go above and beyond to preserve this channel's life. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Suzuka Kobayashi, JD Robbins, Greg Hooper, Sebastian Great, Synth Spaces, K 
Kevin Verhaley, Andrew Bozanski, Edward O'Reilly, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Quang DX, Spuds Matt B, Michael Baker, and all of my other patrons. Thank you all for changing my life. <laughs>